Hello and welcome there to another episode of the Cliff Notes podcast, where we ask a leader and find a way. Today I'm being joined by uh, Jason Resnick. Hey Tristan, thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's great to catch up with you again. And, and whereabouts are you uh, today? Are you uh, in the city or uh, a bit further out? No, I'm, not, I'm actually about a half hour outside of the city. I live on Long Island. Um, so I was, um, I was interested to um, have a chat with you again on, on uh, positioning uh, and uh, specializing uh, for businesses. Um, but maybe mm-hmm. you could start off with just giving us a, a little bit of uh, background uh, of who you are for people who aren't aware of you. Sure. Uh, as you said, my name is Jason. Um, I've run my own business since 2010. I historically, traditionally grew up, if you will, as a web developer, but I've uh, since shifted my business uh, uh, several times, and we'll probably dive into a little bit that here, but um, we'll, I shifted my business to help Establish online businesses, get more customers, get repeat customers, and essentially create raving fans of their brand. Um, and I do that both for web development side of things, like on-site personalization, but also with uh, email automation, uh, behavioral marketing, segmentation, learning about the customers and the leads that are in there um, to essentially position the offer that my clients have right when the uh, lead or customer is most likely to buy. Uh, and we were like a, a buying customer, but um, definitely sounds like uh, you're all, all, all around um, uh, conversations and, uh, and, and speaking to the customer. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, you can't, it's, it's amazing in this world that we live in where we're always connected that a lot of people do not want to have conversations with their customers. Um, it's, it's the best way in which you can actually sell to people like them. It's the best way to understand exactly who they are as a, as a person, but also as you know, somebody who solves problems. And that's what we're in business to do is to solve somebody's problem. So we really have to understand what problem that they have, but also where they want to be tomorrow. Like, what does this look like if we totally solve your problem? Um, where does that actually leave you? And so you can only learn these things by having uh, conversations. And so a lot of this is, is getting into personal conversations, but uh, adding a little bit of scale or, or uh, a little bit of variety to it too, yeah? Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, it's it, you have to have that mix right so i mean as i said i'm a developer i have the mindset of if i have to do the exact same thing twice then it's got to i got to figure out a way to either automate it write something or whatever right like i don't let a computer do this and so for me it's um you can have the conversations one-on-one or a team do it for you or maybe a consultant do it for you with the customers to get their voice their language and how they speak about things but you can also do that by way of email which is what i do for a lot of customers is just automatic trigger emails that go out when certain actions are taken uh, or when certain pages are looked at um, where the conversion doesn't happen. I call them like landing page abandonments. Um, many people may be familiar with like cart abandonment, you know, case in point, you add something to the cart in Amazon, you go away for half an hour, you're going to get an email from Amazon to tell you to go buy the thing that you added into your cart. So take that same idea. And if you're on a contact us page or an order form page or something of that nature, where there's a conversion that you as the business want the person that's actually looking at the page to, to, to take, well, trigger off an email if they don't fill that out when, or get that conversion within X time, right? It could be a half hour, it could be two hours, whatever it is that fits best for you. Um, but in that, you can also say, hey, you know, I know that you make it distracted um, or you change your mind, that's fine too what changed your mind? What was it? Uh, And just prompt a reply Um, and pay attention to the replies. And that come, you know, you could scale those conversations in that way where if one person says it, 
probably five other people think it. So um, you can certainly scale that in a way that's a little bit more, it's human, but it is automated. Mm -hmm. And so um, must be the, the best way to talk to people is, is just to try and talk to everyone, isn't it? Um, I would say talk to every one of your customers if you can. Um, so there's a couple of things here, right? So the reason why I say talk to every one of your customers is, first of all, everybody has their best customer and their worst customer, right? So um, what you can learn from your best customer is, is the language, the things that they like about you and working with your business and things that they actually get from you. Um, you wanna find more customers like that best customer. I mean, it makes sense, right? They're your best. They're probably a long time customer. Uh, they might pay you the most, those sort of things. So you learn all of these things so that you can then go ahead and attract people just like that or build a rapport with that best customer so that they actually spread your good word, right? So they tell their friends, uh, their colleagues, their anybody in their network that may have a solution to the problem that you have say, hey, this guy is a stand-up guy, he does good by me, and so you, know, you might wanna have a chat with them. Now, when I say talk to all your customers is, is that if they're not so good, right, like they're not your best client, um, find out more about that, right? Maybe it's, just a, maybe it's just a line of miscommunication that's happening that they're expecting something, you're expecting something, um, and there's like a mismatch, right? The deliverable is not happening there. So you can clear the air a lot of times too in stressful or strained relationships with customers just by having that conversation to say, hey, how can, how can I be doing better for you, right? Or just what in your business, um, you know, are you having problems with that maybe I can help solve? And not saying that I'm going to solve them, but Maybe there's an opportunity there that where I can help. Um, just clearing the air there goes a long way with, uh, you know, just setting those expectations or resetting those expectations, especially if you've been working together for any length of time. Uh, as a concrete example, um, when I was early on in my business and I was having conversations with my clients and I would, I would always just say, hey, can I have a 10 minute conversation? That's outside of the project. Just want to have a conversation to kind of take your temperature, if you will. Um, and in that conversation, I'd start off with how's business. That kind of gets the greasy wheel turning, if you will. Every business owner likes talking about business. And then second is, is you know, why do you enjoy working with me? And the third one is, is how can I be more awesome? So that's in my language, right? But it's just basically, what can I be doing better? Um, and that question there, that third question was an eye opener for me because I, I tend to over communicate via email, talk to clients. If I run into a problem, I tell them about it as soon as I can um, with whatever information I have at the time. Um, and every single client gets a weekly email from me anyway about the status of things that I'm working on. However, that third question highlighted something that a lot of my clients wanted. And while they appreciated the status emails and all that, they wanted a phone call. They wanted a weekly status phone call. So I said, okay, I, I can do that. I mean, I don't normally because it just takes the time away from the work, but I added a level of my services. And if people were willing to pay for that, um, which the vast majority of clients were willing to pay for that, it was just like me reading the email in the first place. So we had a 20 minute call. And so um, without having those conversations, I would have never known that. And I didn't add any level of service to, I didn't add any skills to the services that I provide rather, but it was easy enough for me to pick up a phone call and sched have every Thursday afternoon a conversation with a client or two. Great. And so, I mean, that, that sounds like uh, if, if you're finding the right thing and the right connection with, uh, with the customer, that's like a specializing or, or choosing a niche. Uh, is, that, is that what you're, you're getting at? 
Yeah, I mean, what you're finding there is that's that's kind of more of like your ideal client, if you will. And there's a there, and there's a, a blurred line there between niching down and specializing as well as versus your ideal client. Um, so what I talked about is more of the the one on one, the client. Right relationship the ideal client the specialization goes to who you serve as a whole meaning like an industry a vertical a type of business um, it could even be a platform if you will right so like you know there's plenty of platforms like for me I specialize in convert kit and drip and WooCommerce platforms um, and so you could specialize in those things, in those areas of business, and understand how the, the technical nuances of those things, um, but also how to talk to people and solve a specific problem that that industry or that as a people or business has. Um, uh, so there's a little bit of, of a difference there because the ideal client is more personality-based, if you will, and specialization of your business is more tailored to this general sort of, you know, umbrella, if you will. Um, while they all tie together, um, the ideal client, you know, some, I personally don't like it, but some people like being micromanaged. They would like to have like really defined checklists uh, from clients to be able to tick things off the box. I'm not like that. It's just not how I work. Um, but also, you know, for me as a service provider, it's just me. So I'm every person in the business, right? Uh, some businesses don't like that. You know, some clients or leads that come into my business, they much rather have an agency behind me. I can't change that, right? So I am who I am. I inject my own personality into it. So I attract those people that are attracted to that personality. Um, and so that's more of the ideal client, if you will, it, while it's a part of that niche or that specialization that I am, the specialization occurs for who I'm the target market that my business actually goes after. That's, that's great. So you're possibly seeing it that, uh, the way you're specializing is because it's still a personal service and it's a service you're offering, uh, as much as say, uh, a much more an idealized product because obviously once a product is made it can't change maybe more people use it whereas the service can adapt it, am I getting at what you're saying yeah I mean I guess as a as concrete example for me is you know ConvertKit is a, a email service provider right um, the service that I provide for my clients is to build automation and marketing campaigns inside of ConvertKit, right? Um, to do specific things, longer sales cycle nurturing, upsells, cross sells, um, even just long-term nurture sequences that go out months at a time, right? So that's what I build inside of ConvertKit. Now, if somebody came off the street and let's just say they had a MailChimp account and they needed all the things that I can do, doesn't mean that I can't do it in MailChimp. It's just that I don't know MailChimp as well as I know ConvertKit. And so I'm not going to take on that client. So I've specialized my business to serve ConvertKit and Drip, who are two ESPs out there. Um, and that's it. So the disqualifier there for me and the leads that are who, who actually become customers of mine is an ESP, right? So the service that I can provide, I can do, but doesn't mean that I should. And I don't do that because for me and how I've worked out the margins in my business and revenue and, and all the time that goes into these things, I've worked into on these two specific platforms. So that's the specialty that I uh, have defined myself and my business. Right, right. So you, you found that you know you can get the quality of results and the quality of service um, with, these, with these tools for your customers uh, and so you know it's worthwhile putting in that time and, and giving them their custom service uh, because you don't the tool's not gonna let you down exactly right yeah and then like I said I know them inside and out I know all the nuances of it and so all of that experience and knowledge that I have 
gets passed on to the client and they get the results that they're looking for, um, you know, just by working with me in the engagement. Mm -hmm. And then in, in, in thinking about, about yourself or, or how, how another business may choose to do this is, was this feedback from clients or, or, or what, what made you choose to, to focus on these? Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a funny, funny process that I've, sort of developed, I guess, in, in this, this way, it came about in a funny way, um, where two years into my business, and I said, I, I started in 2010. And so it was, it was just before 2012, where I proposed to my then girlfriend uh, to marry me. A month later, I told her that I was going to back to getting a full time job because I was completely burned out. And at that time, I was very much a generalist, I was doing all sorts of you know, different technologies, developing on projects that would span months at a time and go back and forth and kind of chase my tail. And I was never, I always felt like I had to play catch up, right? With every brand new project because I had to re, I had to relearn things that I didn't work on for months at a time, right? Um, and I was literally getting burnt out. And so she said to me at the time, she goes, well, you know, you're, <laughs> that's not what you want to do. And I know that, so you definitely know that. Um, and we'll just figure it out. So it, for me, that was like, took me by surprise because she's like the rock in the relationship. She's not a gambler at all. She wants to know exactly where everything is coming from, when it's coming and so on and so forth. And so for her to essentially tell me not to go get a job um, was like the support and the kick in the butt that I needed. And so I sat down for a week um, around four hours a night. Um, I wasn't sleeping well at this time anyway, but it, I was sat down and I essentially analyzed my business. Um, I analyzed my clients, the projects that I was working on, what I liked about them, what I didn't like about them. And I basically, out of all of this, I distilled down what my clients wanted from me, what they liked working with me on, and the tools that they used. And so <clears throat> as I've, my business has evolved over time, I've basically devised this, what I call the client quad, which is basically just a quadrant where, um, you know, and you can do this on a piece of paper where you basically divide the paper into quadrants and you take, for example, in the upper left quadrant, you just bullet list all the clients that you like working with, just names, no reasons, no nothing like that. And you spend 10 minutes on it and you just kind of distill all that stuff down. Then in the right quadrant, you do the opposite of that. So how many clients and projects that you actually don't like working on? Um, and you do this in a bullet, put, bullet point form. Um, and then on the bottom half of the page, what you do in each of those quadrants is look above it and try to figure out what common elements are in at least three quarters of all of those, right? So in the first one, you have what you liked, you know, so you can figure out like what industry they're a part of, um, where the, what stage of business that they're in, um, what location potentially, what industry, all of these other things. You just kind of jot down the, the essentially the, the green lights, if you will. And then on the other side, you do the exact same thing. So what you come at after this exercise is you actually have all of your red flags to look for, for a new lead. Um, and you distilled down essentially your business to then say, hey, look, this is who I actually am working with. And this is what I enjoy. And these are the people. I mean, I worked with this on a, a coaching client and we distilled down that she enjoyed working with women owned white collar businesses um, that were in the greater Boston, Massachusetts area. And it was like such a, it was such a weird realization for her um, that she didn't see because she was working so close to the, you know, she was working so close to it. Um, but until we worked through this exercise, she didn't realize what that was, but the power in that, knowing that um, was, you know, just opened doors for her because she was just, she'd go to specific networking events, go 
go to specific, you know, location meetups and conferences and things like that. And so once you have that at your disposal, it's just a checklist at that point in time. You know exactly who you don't like to work with. You have all those red flags and you, you know who you actually want to go out and target because you have that list there right in front of you. A good way do some introspection in order to unlock what you can achieve uh, in sort of sales and outreach and working with your customers. Is it something you've done periodically? Uh, take a, take a refresh look. Yeah, I've done it actually three, four times in my business where I've actually sat down and, and done this exercise. Three of those times actually turned into me going down a better, better, avenue for my business one of which actually turned me back away from it so it was like an idea that i was thinking about i was going to go through with it um but then as i looked at it i was just like okay yeah this is not where i want to be right so it was like kind of like a checks and balances if you will that i use sometimes where i you know just say okay this is a, an avenue that i could go explore um let me go ahead and work through this exercise, which only takes about an hour to do. Um, and just let me see. Let me see what shakes out from that. Mm -hmm. And then if we're pulling this back to in order to sort of market yourself and improve your, uh, your own selling, um, where would you take this next? If we're, if we're giving these sort of this good piece of advice, um, where would you apply this um, in, in that process? Yeah, in my world, it's a landing page. Um, really, it's just a landing page to go have up someplace um, that once I start having conversations, because in the early stages of any specialization, you definitely want to have that one-on-one -on -one conversation. Um, <clears throat> and once you have those one-on-one -on -one conversations, yeah, at least you have the landing page as kind of like, hey, if you're looking for more information, you could go here. Um, and so that's the first step there. Sponsorship of this podcast has been brought to you by Holding Bay, the digital web agency. Holding Bay specializes in working with B2B companies like manufacturers to build better solutions and drive better sales funnels. So if you would like to build a web application or improve your branding and sales funnel, get in contact today holdingbay.co.uk or call us on 01273 now on my podcast um i had paul sokol um on a recent episode in season seven and he had a actually an interesting uh thought or exercise really to validate these ideas um, once you start to do these things. And the power of Facebook is it, the data behind it at this point in time is so plentiful that what he says is just start running some ads to your quote unquote new segment, your specialization, your new niche to validate the assumptions that you have. Um, and so you could just run $50, $100 on an ad, target the specific special, specialization or niche that you're, you're, the audience that you're actually going after and see if the ad resonates. If it doesn't resonate, fall flat, maybe your assumption's wrong. Maybe it's time to go back to the drawing board. Um, so I haven't yet got to the point where I've used that, but it's definitely, I mean, me sharing that here is like it's in my back pocket so like next time that i do this sort of exercise it's definitely something that i'm actually going to test rather than because you can find an answer real quick right mm -hmm. by running an ad if it people are clicking on it and they're opting into something or they're visiting your landing page that's a lot different than waiting several weeks maybe for a lead to come through so that's this is cool. It's good stuff. Um, and it's nice and simple and actionable. But um, just to dial it back a little bit. Um, so what, what is a, a landing page for you? Just just for people who maybe aren't so familiar with with the term. Sure. A landing page is uh, just a one page. Uh, it's, it's a one pager on your website that has a headline, talks about a little bit about what the topic of the page is, uh, which would 
could be your new specialty. Um, but you could use the headline to say, you know, do you struggle with X, right? If so, well, here's what I'm proposing as the solution. And then, then you can kind of give a little bit of a, a, a synopsis, if you will, on what that could look like. So it's just really just a simple page that's on your website um, so that you don't, have to, you don't have to change your entire website. That's what a lot of people think is like when they start to specialize and, and, and niche down, oh, so now I got to change my whole website. So that's a whole big project in and of itself. But you haven't validated anything yet. So you don't know that this is actually going to pan out to anything. So just create one page, explain what your hypothesis is, what your assumptions are, what your solution is going to be, and what, it, what the benefits of it is, um, and put it on a page on your website so that at least you have a URL that you can point people to. Great, great. So this, this uh, as an idea, it could be for uh, a single product uh, or a new, new um, item that you have, um, but it, equally, it could be for something a little bit more intangible or a little bit more broad, uh, sort of covering a market or an opportunity or a problem that people are having, uh, say, with, with safety or reliability. And where would you take that next? You've you got this page up and um, it's got uh, some nice uh, text and pictures on um, sort of outlining this, this idea uh, and how you've sort of stepped through the, the different parts of, of the sort of problem and the solution. Where do we take this next? Yeah, the next thing is, is once you have that page up, give them something in which they can reach out to you, whether that's a phone call, whether that's a contact form on the page, something of that nature. Um, as the conversion point, right? So if you have this page up, you're having the conversations, you're directing people to this page. If you don't hear anything, then something's amiss somewhere, right? But if you have people calling you, then you can further those conversations, further them in the sales cycle, um, and hopefully close them, right? And then you can learn from those conversations that you're having with the people that come through your website um, to then use their words back on your website. This is a, this is a living, breathing thing um, where your headline might change. You might craft the offer in a different way um, and so on and so forth. So the next thing is, is to have some call to action on that page for those readers to take, to get in touch with you. So we could almost think of it a little bit like a, a whiteboard we're, we're blocking this idea out or a shop window or something and we can adapt it and we haven't got to redesign the whole website. Um, but we can sort of iterate over this, um, almost as a product in itself, um, for, for trying to get that pitch, right. Get, get the audience right. Um, and, and then driving traffic to it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, one of the worst things to do is to build these things in a silo and not actually get, get it in the wild. From my experience, um, getting messages out and having your potential target market look at this um, is the best way to get feedback into it um, so that you can then adjust accordingly. I mean, it might be something that you totally abandoned because you, you know, you missed the mark, so to speak. Um, so that's, that for me is something that I urge anybody, all my coaching clients, my my service clients, things like that, when they are thinking of a new product, service, um, even just 
a guideline or an opt-in or something of that nature, um, get it on a landing page. Let's see what people think about it um, and learn from their from their their eyeballs and their ears and their voice, um, and then we can pivot on that. And you mentioned Facebook as as one of the channels um, for for driving in traffic. Um, that might not have been someone's first thought uh, if they're looking for for business sales. Um, have you found sort of that there is a, a sort of a business audience or approaching people in a more personal way that uh, that has results for you? Yeah, I mean, I was one of those people that <laughs> really just never thought of um, Facebook as much of a a business platform. Um, LinkedIn obviously is more of that ilk, but um, the the ad platform that is on Facebook, look, CEOs, they're looking at cat pictures and their nieces and nephews and everybody else, just like just like we are. And so um, your target market is on Facebook, most likely. Um, and there's no reason why that, you know, depending on how sophisticated you want to get, if they look at your landing page to retarget them on Facebook, even if they're at their house and they don't check Facebook at work, um, you just pop up front of mind because of that. Um, it, it's, it's a nice way to, you know, especially if you're catering to the executives and such, especially us business owners, our brain never shuts off, right? So like, even if we are home, we're sitting on the couch watching Netflix and we're trying to wind down from the day, if we're scrolling through our phone um, and we see an ad that's relative to the business, I know I do it and I know plenty of other people do it. Um, they get a click on it, check it out, might be interesting um, and, and move forward on the next day if, if need be, right? Because mm -hmm. just because that ad was there. Um, it's why commercials are on TV too. Like commercials are there regardless of relevance, right? Um, you know, I don't need to buy a new car, but I see a new car full, you know, commercials all the time. Facebook is the complete opposite. There's, those ads are relevant to you because those, that's your data that we're using to show those ads to. So, um, it's a, and it's a cheap platform, you know, mm -hmm. for, for the most part. Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, it's definitely an avenue that it took me a little while to <laughs> to open my own mind to it, but it's definitely well worth it. Yeah. So if if experimenting um, uh, with with their own marketing or um, or working with a with a partner to to get going, um, is can you start with sort of small amounts like sort of uh, fifty hundred dollars and and work up, or do you need to start with uh, much bigger numbers to get results? Uh, well, it, I mean, it, yeah, that's a big question. I mean, you could certainly start with fifty dollars just to see what the results are. Um, and then take it from there. I mean, you certainly want to give it enough time. I mean, it is a complex algorithm and things like that. And so you want it to give it enough of a runway for it to work. Um, sometimes $50, depending on what you're, who you're targeting and things like that, isn't enough just because it's a competitive space. Um, but you know, you can, you could certainly create a piece of content that bounces you back to the landing page that further deep dives on that piece of content um, and throw $50 at it and it, and it's fine. Um, if you really want something cheap because of the way that the Facebook, I mean, Facebook wants you to stay on Facebook, uh, create a 30 second or a minute long video, right? And run an ad to that. Now that's gonna be a lot cheaper because one, Facebook's gonna reward you with a lower price because you're actually not taking them off site um, and you're actually letting them stay on for longer. Um, so that's going to be cheaper we're out to go. But yeah, all of this stuff is kind of like a nuanced type thing. It, it, it definitely depends, but um, there's no reason why you couldn't start with $50. Mm -hmm. So it might be the sort of thing that um, you, you can have a go at um, and just to get an understanding of what it is and you're not going to um, be, be way out of pocket. And, um, but it, it is the sort of thing that's going to be worth um, speaking to someone who's done before uh, to, to really start leveraging it. Yeah. 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 I mean, you don't necessarily have to think that you're going to spend $10,000 on ad spend on Facebook right away. 
Um, if you're just testing something, spend, you know, 50, 100, 150, see where it takes you. And if you don't get any results, then okay, maybe this isn't the right audience that I'm targeting, or maybe the messaging is wrong or something, but at least you get some information back that allows you to adjust accordingly. Now we've, we've got up a, a landing page. We've, we've worked out um, who we want to talk to. Um, there, have you got any um, uh, good ways to, to stay on top of the specialism? Um, it doesn't sound like it's, uh, it's just a short hop, but it, uh, it is having conversations with people. Yeah, I mean, the, the best way to stay on top of it is, is to find out if, you, if you've had conversations with leads or anybody in the, in the space, uh, find out where they're getting their information from, the, the influencers, if you will, or the publications or the conferences or, uh, you know, whatever it is that they're getting their information from. Um, because if you could do that, then one, you could find out where more of them are. But for two, um, you start to then get information about that specific specialty. Um, the influencers, the conferences, these are people that are established in those specialties and they know the language. So you could pay attention to what their website's saying, uh, even hop on their email lists, if you will. Um, you know, you're not saying that you have to buy you know, and go to the conferences and stuff, but see what the talks are about, right? And you can see what the titles are and things like that. And you start to get a sense of what you know, what the businesses are like in that specialty, what they're struggling with, what are they interested in, uh, how they talk about problems, how they talk about solutions. Uh, and so that this allows you to then go ahead and stay on top of that specialty so that as you, as you start to grow this part of your business, um, this actually starts to replace your uh, sales process you know the conversations that you have this becomes your business um and you start to see like okay now i'm entrenched in this i understand exactly what how they speak about their problems how they speak about their solutions and i could tailor my messaging accordingly great great just getting in that voice of the customer and uh, uh and and expanding into uh, what's going on in the media. Um, that's that's mm -hmm. what I'm hearing back from you and, and how, how they're seeing from other people are talking about it and what they're speaking about, um, what they're having conversations about. Um, it is sort of a change from, uh, from a few years ago when there wasn't sort of the internet and the sort of social channels. It was sort of much harder to find out what, uh, what your audience was talking about, what your customers are talking about um, without going uh, one by one. Yeah. And I mean, that's, that's the beauty of it, right? Like we can all do this from our own homes if we want to. Right. But like, you know, back in the day, this is the same process that, you know, business has been doing for centuries, if you will. Right. Like, you know, when it was the agricultural age and farmers would go to, you know, other farms and comp, you know, not conferences, but like, you know, markets where other farmers were at, uh, what tools are you using? How they, you know, things like that. And as that advanced, I mean, even in the 19th century, when, you know, you had the traditional salesman who would leave his wife and kids at home and he would trek off to a client site, states away, countries away, whatever it is. Um, that's the same thing here right? He's learning more about, you know, what his potential customers are looking for. Um, and we could just do it at scale with the internet um, in a matter of a couple of hours, just really learning, you know, doing some rabbit hole surfing, if you will, um, and seeing what influencers, what conferences are talking about and things like that. You don't need to actually physically go to those locations anymore, which is what, you know, I mean, this is, the this is this is why I've built my business the way it is because um, we have these these advancements in technologies to be able to do that today. Thing, things have changed, but you found your your way now. Um, where do you think the industry is going in the next sort of five or ten years? Um, do you think you're able to see that far out? Um, well, I'd like to think that I could. At least I could see where my business is going to be. 
Um, you know, I, like I said, I help establish online businesses. So what does that look like? Well, in the grand scheme of things, the internet is still very, very young, right? Um, and so th if I look at it a decade ago, there was no iPhone, right? So like, okay, <laughs> now everybody has one, right? And so, um, you know, just to be able to know where technology is going to go, if I was that smart, um, I don't know, we would be talking, right? But, but in, in and of itself, for me, I know and I feel at least that in my space, who I help and the tools that I use, what's happening in that space is interesting because the, if, I, if you take email marketing as a whole, um, what was going on five years ago um, where businesses would just broadcast out they would just say you know say the same thing to everyone no matter who it was whether they were lead customer and otherwise uh, they would broadcast out and that would be the thing right so you kind of get a sense of you know on the other side as a customer okay yeah you could tell that this is sent to everybody but the thing is that's evolved over recent times and would probably will still continue to evolve over the next, I would say three to four years is this idea of the mom and pop shop, right? So like everybody loves the experience. Everybody loves to be catered to. Everybody loves the idea that if they have a local favorite store in their town, that they walk in, whatever it is, let's just say it's a coffee shop, your coffee and your muffin are there waiting for you because the owner sees you every day, right? And they know exactly what you order. That whole idea is coming to fruition on the internet. Um, and so email marketing is starting to become way more sophisticated. Uh, you have to understand the customer. It's not just a numbers game anymore where whoever has the biggest email list wins. Um, you know, I see some of my clients have less than a thousand people on their email list and they're making multiple six figures from them um, over you know, the, the year. So it's like, it doesn't matter now so much that um, you, know, you have the numbers anymore. You actually do have to understand that customer. And that's what we were talking about at the top. And that whole experience factor um, over the next three to four or five years, um, I think is going, you're gonna see that more and more. That's great. Um, and now I've uh, spent half an hour um, pushing you into a corner uh, on this topic. What three things are you going to grab to come out on top? Yeah, um, what I'm going to grab to come out on top um, for my business, it's I really like if if I had a magic wand today, I would want to know every single subscriber what their pain point is of so in other words, what they want to know today and where they want to be tomorrow. Um, that, that's the number one thing that I want to know from my own leads and customers. I have a good sense of what that looks like, um, but not everybody buys. I don't have a close rate of 100%, so um, something different. Right? So that's, that's first and foremost. Secondly, um, you know, for, for my business, I really... I'd love to be a better writer. <laughs> um, I, I know that I'm, I'm, I'm a fairly good writer. Um, you know, I, I, I've learned, I've worked hard at it, but um, you can always improve. And, and that's one of the things that I always try to do. And I just try to learn from other people that I respect and know in the industry um, that write very well. Um, so those, yeah, those, were, those would be the things that I would try to grab to be on top. No, I think those are, those are great. Um, those are great things. So, um, yeah, no, thanks for, for spending some time today and, uh, and helping us learn um, how we can uh, uh, niche down and also expand uh, our audience by with, uh, talking to our customers. Um, is there anything you'd like to uh, share or how we can get in contact with you afterwards? Yeah, sure. Um, you can find me online just about anywhere. Uh, my website is res, that's with three Z's, R-E-Z-Z-Z dot -Z -Z com. Uh, or find me on Twitter, um, at res there, also with three Z's, and I'm always open to a conversation. Um, if you like what you, you heard here, 
um, on my website. You could drop in on my newsletter. It's right there on the front page there. Um, and I actually walk you through some of these things that um, step by step that I, I shared here um, in that first sequence that you would get. Mm -hmm. no, that sounds great. Well, uh, thanks again. Uh, and we look forward to speaking to you and, uh, and catching up. Yeah, thanks again, Tristan. Appreciate it. Thanks for joining us today on the Cliff Notes podcast. Uh, if you'd like to uh, speak to me or the guest afterwards, uh, you can contact them directly or via the website, cliffnotespodcast.com or on Twitter, at cliffnotespod. And uh, we look forward to uh, any feedback and uh, comments and uh, have a good day.